You're listening to Worth Electronics' What's Up radio podcast, where each week we're seeing what's up in the world of electronics and PCB design. We'll be checking in with leading industry experts and Worth Electronic technical specialists who are going to shine a light on interesting topics, such as energy harvesting, wireless power transfer, EMI issues, and so much more. Tune in to get technical design tips and applications during your commute, at your desk, or wherever you might be with Worth Electronics What's Up podcast. So picture this, you're an engineer, you have your finished design, and you are ready for testing. But surprise, it's not passing those EMC standards. This is a very common occurrence, and one of the last techniques used by many experienced engineers during this EMC testing is shielding. In today's podcast, we'll discuss the miracles that can happen when you utilize shielding in your design. Dominic Zeller, application engineer with Worth Electronic, is going to discuss how shielding efficiency is calculated and also what coupling effects can happen and what you can do to deter them. Zeller will then finish up with how openings in the design can introduce some major problems and end with the role of the connector and how it should be properly connected to the shielding. Here's Dominic Zeller with Shielding, a Practical Approach. Um, again, my name is Dominic Zeller. I'm a field application engineer with Wirt Electronics. And today my topic is going to be shielding. Well, shielding is not that easy and the time frame is quite um, tight. So I will try my best to stay in time. Um, yeah. What is going to be our focus? Well, the first thing is going to be theoretical aspects of shielding. We will see and um, use the formulas to classify um, different materials for our shielding applications. We will also have to talk a bit about um, coupling effects. And we will see the usage of a shielding um, in connectors and a bit about shielding materials. Okay, well, the first thing is general countermeasures regarding EMC. Well, the first thing you can do is improve your layout, but the big problem with improving your layout or doing something with the layout um, is there's always one problem and a lot of solutions. And worst, even more opinions about that. And at a certain point, you will have to use filters to filter out common and differential noise. If filtering alone is not working anymore, the last step you can do is using shielding. Yeah? Um, the fourth step would be uh, turn off the, the power because without current, you will not have any EMI issues. But we cannot do that when we have an official EMC test. So the main focus is going to be, of course, shielding. If we want to speak about shielding, we also have to speak about antennas. Uh, antennas, or the wavelength, in this case, a lambda, is, well, the length of a wave. And with the wavelength divided by 4, uh, in this case, you have quite a good antenna and a good receiving antenna is also a good sending antenna for this certain frequency so if you have let's say um, radio in europe you have 100 megahertz and this would be the wavelength would be three meters and if you divide it by four you have 75 centimeters sorry for um, the european measurement units um, 75 centimeters is about this so it's typically a cable length and in this case a lot of cables especially if you are outside of your application are good antennas for radio uh, if you increase the frequency speed in this case wi-fi 2.45 gigahertz the size of your antenna is going to be reduced in this case lambda would be 12 centimeters and divided by four would be three centimeters that's about this three centimeters so you are already on the circuit board and a lot of um antennas can be found there so 
shielding would be a good approach to um, reduce those um, nasty effects. Well, we also have to talk about coupling effects. We, we always have an electromagnetic wave, um, but in the near field, we often have dominant things, like if it's a capacitive coupling, um, that just means one thing, um, set load is quite high because then you have an electric field. You have no current and you have an electric field. So the E field of your electromagnetic wave is dominant. If you have set load is quite small or ideally zero, current is able to flow. And in this case, you will have a magnetic field, so inductive coupling. And one last thing that sometimes can be overseen is impedance coupling. If you have two signals using the same ground plane, they can interfere each other. So um, in school, we learn um, current is always going to, to choose the path of the least resistance. This is true but only if you have DC current. As soon as you introduce frequency, so AC current, um, current is going to be directly under the signal trace, but only if it's able to do so. As soon as you have an opening in your ground plane, current has to find a new way in this is the way of the least impedance. Uh, and by doing so, often loops are going to occur. And those loops have to be avoided by all costs. I often get the question, well, at what certain frequency is this going to be an issue? Is it 500 hertz? Is it one kilohertz? Is it 100 megahertz? Well, as you can see in this simulation, um, until 200 um, hertz, current is always going to choose the path of the least resistance. But if you increase the frequency, current is going to slowly adapt and will go directly under this conductor. And at one kilohertz, most of the current is directly under the signal trace. And the further you go uh, up with your frequency, the more uh, concentrated um, the current is going to be under the transmission line, which is not a bad thing because you have one current in this direction and the um, current going back in this direction, both will create magnetic field lines, but they are opposite to each other and therefore most of them will cancel each other out. Well, they will not cancel each other out, but they will reduce the effects in the near vicinity quite a lot. So this is a thing we want to have because as soon as the current has to go a different direction, this magnetic field um, is going to be increased by quite a lot. I tried to do some measurements beforehand and I will show you the measurements. A uh, feedback all I already got is that the, um, the, the quality of the video is not that ideal for transmitting. So we will of course give you these videos as well as the uh, documentation about the presentation. But what can you see? Well, I will explain it just in a, a few words. On the right side, you have a signal generator generating a square wave, simple square wave, two megahertz and I think two volt um, peak peak. And on the left side, you have the um, oscilloscope with a built-in FFT measurement unit. And the idea is we have this sort of simple signal that's going to be transmitted through the cable onto my circuit board. On my circuit board, it's basically an, a two-layer circuit board. On the top, I have the transmission line, and on the bottom, everything is ground. So it's going to go over my transmission line 
here I have a 50 ohm resistor and it's ideally going back um, the same direction. So, and what you can see is if I use my self-made near field probe, if you are on top of the transmission line, you will see, of course, a field, in this case, a magnetic field. And the further you go away, well, the further it's going to be reduced. Okay, so, which is quite nice. And this is only the case if the current is able to throw directly under the transmission line. As soon as you have an opening with the same setup, the same um, signal form and the same frequency, even if you go away of the transmission line, you will still have a field. And um, so increasing the distance won't have an effect on uh, the measured um, field, as you can quite clearly see in the video. I hope you can see it quite clearly. Um, why is this relevant? Well, I mean, if we have coupling effects, and it doesn't matter if you have inductive coupling or capacitive coupling, one way to reduce coupling would be to increase the distance between both transmission lines. Or, and that's the reason why we are doing this webinar, is we could introduce shielding materials. And in this case, I will just use a quite simple um, conductive metal plate, and I will push it between both transmission lines. And we already can see, of course, we can see on the second transmission line, something is going to be transmitted. It's not ideally. Here we can now see if I increase the distance, the value is going to be reduced as well. It's more clear if you can hear my voice in the video. But as I can show you with real measurements, by increasing the distance, well, you will also decrease the coupling. If you put shielding in between, well, then my crosstalk is going to be reduced. It's only going to be reduced if my shielding is also connected to ground. It's going to be increased by uh, a decreased by a little if it's not connected, but if you connect it to the ground, it's going to be quite drastic, as you can see here, quite nice. And it's about 30 dB. Again, now we have the impedance um, coupling part. If current is not going to flow directly under the transmission line, and it has to find a new way, there will be coupling, even if we increase the distance between both transmission lines. And that's quite a big problem because um, due to the loop, the transmitted coupling is quite high. Uh, so ideally, you should avoid loops. How are we going to create loops? Well, sometimes connectors are the culprit. Uh, you have to have some sort of um, cut out in your circuit board or worst case, sometimes uh, different electronic um, parts are going to have the same effect on your circuit board. Yes, so um, some basic things I have to, to speak about is conductivity means how much um, con conductivity a metal plate has. Permeability is a bit different, it's more regarding uh, magnetic field lines uh, and how much more they prefer to stay in the material before they go out um, into free air. So the higher the permeability, the more focused my magnetic field lines are going to be in the, in the material itself. Okay. A small reminder, because I sometimes get the question regarding connectors a lot, should you or could you make gold and tin plated connectors? The same um, goes with, um, well, shielding. You should be aware that galvanic corrosion exists and this is going to happen. Let's make an example to make it a bit easier. 
gold and gold you can mate because the voltage difference is going to be zero so ideally now if you use gold and tin plated you can see the voltage difference is going to be 0 0.67 volt and in this case galvanic corrosion is going to happen and in this case tin is going to be attacked by gold now a rule of thumb states that you have to be at least uh, or not more than uh, 0 0.3 volts apart uh, so everything in gray should be theoretically be no problem but if you want to be 100 percent sure stay in the green corridor okay and then we are at the main topic shielding well shielding we are going to talk about the theoretical part absorption reflection and apertures or openings the basic idea of shielding is quite easy explained it's a bit like a, well a shield um, you have an incoming noise and you do not want to transmit it into your case or into your application some part of it is going to go through the material itself by that ideally it's going to be absorbed absorb is always um, energy getting transformed into heat a small part is going to be transmitted or a big part depending on what material you are using this re reflection term can occur if the shielding thickness is not that thick in this case um, you have to put some value um, onto the formula um, but it's mostly 1 dB or 2 dB okay and if your shielding efficiency is 60 db the 1 db is not going to have a big impact on your overall shielding efficiency now we have two formulas either for the electrical or for the magnetic field but it's the same huh? the difference between the incoming and the transmitted is always the shielding efficiency so what did um, mr shelkonov do well in 1930s in the bell laboratories he um, created this formula. Now, shielding efficiency is nothing else than absorption plus reflection plus this so-called re reflection term. Okay, so what is absorption? Well, absorption, I already told you, um, is basically changing something into heat. And the main uh, thing that's going to affect my absorption is, of course, the thickness. You a small thought experiment if you drive with your car 200 miles per hour into a wall or if you drive with two miles per hour into a wall well the damage of the car is going to be quite different of course eh? the faster the the car is going to be the more damage it's going to have and it's the same with absorption the wall is, of course, doing a thing, and the speed of my signal. But what you, what you can quite easily see is steel is quite a nice uh, shielding material, and it's cheap. So it's mechanically stable, it's cheap, and it has a good absorption rate. That's normally not the case. Most of the times you have to use gold, and it's expensive, and you try to avoid it. Um, absorption is quite nice. Reflection is a bit more complicated because depending on if you are in the far field or in the near field, the formulas are going to change. You are in the far field most of the times if your um, noise is at least lambda divided by two and p far away. Again, if your signal speed is quite fast, you will be quite fast in, in the far field. Let's say uh, if you have, I don't know, 2.4 gigahertz signal, you are already with 15 to 20 centimeters in the far field. If you have 30 megahertz, you need 10 meters. Uh, that's 10 meters regarding EMC chambers. So what is reflection? Well, the reflection is simply explained the same with coaxial connectors. A difference in impedance is going to cause a reflection. And so we have one value defined by the material itself. Only true if the skin effect 
or the thickness of your shielding is at least three times the skin effect. Most of the times it is the case because it has to be mechanically stable and aluminum sheets, um, really thin ones or aluminum foil in this case, would already be thick enough for that um, formula. Well, and why is it in the fire field quite stable? Because of this, the intrinsic impedance of air is over 377 ohm. And in this case, you can use this for the far field. As soon as we go in, well, here, just an overview, it starts quite high and it goes down quite fast. And at a certain point, it's going to affect, negatively affect your overall shielding efficiency. For the far field, it's quite easy because, again, the impedance is 377 ohm. As soon as we are in the near field, it's hardly depending on what electric field you have. Oh, sorry, what field you have, either electric or magnetic. If it's electric, the impedance is quite high. If it's magnetic, the impedance is quite low. And this has a major impact on your overall shielding efficiency. Why? Just an overview. Here we have the near field for the electric field, nearly the same as in the far field, but the magnetic field is going to have a bigger impact because it starts quite low and at 30 to 100 kilohertz, it's starting to have an effect on your shielding efficiency. Uh, that means if you have the global shielding efficiency, you can see on the left side, the far field, you are way above 60 to 100 decibel. This is also just calculated. I mean, everything above 100 dB makes no sense financially and also regarding any measurements. It's quite hard to go above 100 dB to measure anything. What, but what you can see is in the electric field, it's nearly the same, so you have it's quite easy to shield something when it's an electric field. Uh, you only need something conductive. When you have the magnetic field, you will see the thing that a lot of Audi engineers have to fight with because at 100 kilohertz, shielding efficiency is going to go up. Below that, well, magnetic fields are quite hard to shield. You can only use special materials, soft magnetic materials, to try to shield it. Sometimes drilling, oh, sorry, drilling, twisting um, can help and of course increase the distance of your magnetic noise if that's possible. Yeah, of course, now we had the, all the, the, the calculation fund, but we are in a day and age where we can also use computers. And in this case, we can use simulation software to um, make it a bit easier for us. The bad thing about simulation software is that it's most often quite expensive and you will always need a measurement because you have to compare something. And in this case, the real life measurement with your um, simulation model. And if they are fitting, well, you can use it for more complex shapes. And in this case, just an example, um, simulation and measurement, sorry for the German um, title, um, are well on top of each other. So the, the simulation model is nice and we can use it. So when we look at connectors, what are we choosing in we as with electronic? Well, most often we use brass or steel and stainless steel, hardly depending on the application or in this case on the connector itself. I mean, USB-C needs 10,000 mating cycles, so it has to be mechanically quite stable. And also your shielding has to be mechanically quite stable. And in this case, we cannot use brass. Brass is often used when the shielding is not that hard or if we want to use our stamping tool quite often uh, to decrease cost. In the perfect world, we would not have to talk about um, shielding efficiency if we are always above 100 dB. This is only the case if we have a 
an application or a, a case in this case um, that has no openings at all. As soon as if we as soon as we introduce openings into our casing, we will decrease the shielding efficiency. And if the opening is equal or bigger than lambda divided by two, your shielding is useless. Most often you can see in industrial applications, they not use divided by two, but divided by 20. Military applications divided by 50. It's just to be 100% sure that your shielding is not failing. And of course, in military applications, especially in, let's say, uh, spacecrafts, you cannot um, send an, an astronaut um, to the moon to resolder uh, a failed shielding experiment. Um, better safe than sorry. And but the difference is again just a value. Huh? Divided by 20 is going to be at zero uh, faster than divided by two. It only shows the zero, but it goes into the negative and into the negative means you will create antennas. So sometimes your slot in your casing can act as a real life antenna. Uh, another reason to avoid slots if possible. Um, there is a quite nice um, guideline um, free in the internet um, produced or published by NASA they of course have a lot of additional parameters to um, describe the shielding efficiency but in the end there is only a safety net between the nasa uh, between the nasa in this case and the old divided by two um, rule of thumb yeah um, so how can we ap increase aperture sizes or openings without decreasing our shielding efficiency? Well, there's one quite easy way to do that. A lot of openings. And we try that the opening itself is not bigger than lambda divided by 2 or divided by 20. And all the openings have to be apart as well, at least lambda divided by 2. Because in this case, then for your signal, you want to block your um, thousand openings will look like a, a solid plane. A, a, a quite easy example would be, I'm quite tall, I'm one meter 90, so nearly two meters. And old houses in Europe sometimes have smaller doors. So in this case, for me, it would look like there is no actual door. Again, a, a, a small uh, thought experiment. Mm, so what is the main purpose of a, of a connector? Well, continuity. Um, reduce the opening in your casing with EMI fingers. Um, further transmit or transport your shielding with an internal connector. And of course, connect your shielding also to the shielding of your PCP, or in this case, the PCP itself. And um, cables can act as an antenna as well, because if you have a current going in this direction and coming back in this direction, what do you have? Well, you created a loop. Loops are quite nice regarding antenna gain. So you have to reduce the loop by either decreasing the distance or by drilling, sorry, twisting the cables. Uh, Twisting the cables is only going to work if those are not two signal lines, because if you do twist two signal lines, you are going to have quite a nice crosstalk, and that's going to be a thing you want to avoid. If you want to further shield everything, you can also use um, electrical shielding or e-field shielding, in this case, just something conductive. Um, if you have a slow Sunday afternoon and you want to fight with someone in the internet or on the internet, um, the question regarding on how to actually connect the shielding, one side, both sides, no side at all, is going to have yeah, a big impact on that. Why? 
because in this case most of the times um, a lot of people um, um, well have opinions and sometimes those opinions are even true in this um, example you can see not only one arm line but more lines and we have common noise uh, common mode noise sorry so if we connect the shielding on no side at all we have of course our e field and the current has to go over the ground plane back to the source and in this case creating a big loop so of course well you will have radiated noise if you connect the shielding on one side you will still have common mode noise current going down here here it's going to decide either go over the shielding or over the ground plane in this case it can only go over the ground plane because we have not connected it on both sides so we will still have a magnetic field created by the loop but the e field is going to be shielded why well the inner conductor and the outer shielding you can um um how to explain that well the inner conductor and the outer shielding are connected by a capacitance, uh, as a, a theoretical capacitance. And by that, my E field can be short circuited by only connecting it on one side. If you connect the shielding on both sides, the idea is quite easy. You have common mode noise going over your, well, in this case, um, your resistor or your impedance, doesn't matter. And here it can decide either go over the ground plane or over the shielding. And if your shielding is um, has a quite low impedance, it will always choose the shielding. And by that, if you have again two currents creating opposite magnetic fields, the magnetic fields will be drastically reduced or even, well, canceled out. But Again, sometimes this can create ground loops. So if this potential of the ground plane and this potential of the ground plane have different potential, potential potentials, well, then you will have current flow. And to reduce the risk, sometimes you can see those capacitance. Capacitance means um, the shielding is connected on both sides, but um, for DC current, it looks like an open connection. And for high frequency noise, it's going to look like a short circuit. OK. But again, I also have customers in, in Austria, in this case, who were failing the EMC test. And when they opened the shielding on one side, they passed. So for the signal, that's going to be shielded. It's always best to connect on both sides, but for the application, it sometimes can be the opposite. So we are in this trial and error phase again, or the, the black magic, the witchcraft, uh, part of the electric universe. Um, to explain this phenomenon a bit better, I also did, of course, create a small, measurement what you can see on the right side same setup simple square wave going through the cable into my coax cable in the inner conductor going over to the to the right side on the right side it's connected with a 50 ohm to my ground plane and on the cable itself i have a snap ferrite and some loops to catch the magnetic field and the idea is if I connect my shielding on the right side, my high frequency noise, or in this case, the square wave, is not going to choose the, the, the way over the ground plane, creating a big loop, but it's going to go over the shielding. And by that, reducing the transmitted or emitted uh, magnetic noise. So. I will skip all the explanation. So, and if I turn on the FFT of my oscilloscope, 
you can see what exactly well you can see of course there's a, a, a magnetic field and the idea is now if i connect it on the right side it's going to reduce this value you will see an overview in the short um, but what you can see now is this jumping and this jumping effect occurs when one side of your shielding is not that low impedant in this case pigtails uh, if you choose a lot of uh, shielding material and you twist it and then you solder it on one point well then you have this jumping as soon as it's a, a low impedance um, connection you will have a reduction in this case 30 db 30 db is a lot or not a lot depending on how much you are over the value that's allowed i mean if you are 130 db over the allowed uh, value 30 db shielding is not going to help you at all um, so again shielding is the last step you're going to do not the first yeah we also did of course measure that in an emc chamber and what you can see quite easily is well red is without connecting on both sides and blue is connecting on both sides but still we are failing the emc test so at this point we should have to think about layout changes or even um, adding additional filters if possible um, most of the times, well, here you can see a bad example of a pigtail. Again, one centimeter of conductor is already about 10 nano Henry of impedance or inductance in this case. Uh, and by increasing the frequency, you will increase the impedance. And at a certain point, your signal is going to switch back, not over your shielding, but over maybe a, a ground pin in in the inner side of your cable um braided shielding should be covering at least 58 uh, sorry 85 percent of your cable and maybe twisted pairs should be shielded separately that's just an example for a, 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 a network cable how can you find out if the shielding of your cable is quite nice or not that nice well there's only one way you have to cut open the cable if you spend a lot of money or not a lot of money on a cable this will not or most often have no effect on the shielding quality so better just cut it open and see how the shielding was done because sometimes this can happen to reduce costs you often find those shielding foils thin materials in this case metal um, and a plastic foil or plastic tape that's carrying the metal um, foil to make it mechanically more stable and flexible but what can happen is if the two conductive parts are not meeting you will create a big slot through your complete cable so not only will your um, cable shielding will be useless but again you will build antennas for certain frequencies better do some kind of bending to even decrease the opening itself uh, that's then hardly depending on the cable manufacturer ideally a thick material um, that's completely conductive is the thing you are going to choose here just an, a small example what's going to happen with a five millimeter opening with 100 megahertz one gigahertz and five gigahertz well 40 db 29 db 15 db uh, 15 db is not a good value for your shielding you should go in the range of 30 40 to 60 db this is also the reason why we try as a manufacturer to um, reduce those openings sometimes we have to do them to increase holding forces of the connectors and if we insert the female or the male part depending on the connector um, we will of course close those uh, openings 
one small thing regarding the shielding because sometimes i see that when people are desperate uh, in emc tests well if i fail my emc test what i'm going to do is i will put on as much material as possible and then i even fail harder at my test what is the problem with this approach well when you want a connecting cable an interconnecting cable you try always that it has not a lot of resistive losses in this case you will use a lot of material a lot of material means not a lot of resistance the small diameter will have not a big impact on your capacitive value but it will of course have an impact on your inductance resulting in a typical um, impedance of 50 to 100 ohm shielding you try as hard to not use a lot of material because the more material you save the more the costs are going to go down um, so not a lot of material means a lot of resistance due to the size of the shielding we have a big capacitance and due to um, the, the limited amount of material you or we are using we also have a small inductance value resulting in a typical value of one to five ohm for the shielding and that's exactly when you see it with usb you will want a high dc resistance on your shielding because what happens if you have a lot of material this value is going to go down and maybe your um, ground or your vcc is going to choose the direct path over your shielding and then you have those ground loops and you want to avoid that as best as you can so if you add more material because you want more absorption well then use uh, a, capaci a capacitance on one on, on one side yes so just a, a small overview capacitive coupling can be reduced by um, well using shielding avoid parallel conductors in a cable that's going to be quite hard um, increase maybe the distance between conductors that's also quite hard um, the easiest way to shield electric fields or in this case capacitive coupling is with conductive materials yeah we have a lot of that in the isos portfolio you can choose um, a lot uh, then the same with capacitive coupling no sorry that should mean inductive coupling there's a typo you should reduce the loop surface by twisting the cables or increasing the distance of the noise and the the thing that's getting um, disturbed um, or use soft magnetic ferrite material with a high permeability now higher the permeability the better for your magnetic shielding the bad thing about shielding is always or most of them that you have a lot of manual labor so not only the parts can be quite cost demanding but also uh, the manual labor that comes with the shielding Attached images are available in most podcast streaming networks. Visit Worth Electronic online to find the entire line of shielding materials, including ferrites for cable and PCB assembly, common mode chokes, filter lines, shielded connectors, and EMC design kits. This podcast was taken from an updated Worth Electronic webinar. To view the materials and replay the webinar on demand, visit our website at www.we-online.com slash webinars or click the link attached in this podcast. You're listening to Worth Electronics What's Up Radio Podcast, where each week we are seeing what's up in the world of electronics and PCB design. We'll be checking in with leading industry experts and Worth Electronic tech specialists. We're going to shine a light on interesting topics like energy harvesting, wireless power transfer, EMI issues, and so much more. Tune in to get technical design tips and applications during your commute at your desk or wherever you might be with Worth Electronics What's Up Podcast.